Harry Truman, it has been said, to have always wanted a one-armed economist. Because whenever he asked an economist a question, the response usually took the form of, on the one hand, A, but on the other hand, B. Yeah. There are four ways that uh, modern economies can organize their economies. They can be socialisms, competitive market economies, they can be uh, fascism, or they can be communism. The argument frequently used against competitive market economies is that it permits man to exploit man, whereas under socialism and communism, it's the other way around. That's good. We can also then categorize those economies on the basis of who controls those resources. And the controllers of that resource could be individuals, or they could be the government. In a market economy, in a market economy, those choices are made by those who are willing and able to pay, and therefore we're going to argue that a market economy has individual ownership as well as individual control. And the other three I mentioned are scattered around depending on how you match up ownership and, and, and control. I want to point out to you that when you receive income, you really have only three options. All right? I don't want to use the word choice because the first option is taxes. All right. So you receive income, you have to allocate some of that income to taxes. So you really have only one other choice after that. Do you want to spend or do you want to save? If you're spending, you're using this current income to buy stuff. That's George Carlin's famous words. We talk about goods, services. Well, it's stuff, okay? George Carlin says, why do we have big houses? Because we got so much damn stuff. We need some place to store that stuff. <laughs> Some of you have been there, obviously, all right? So, then you have your consumer-consumer choice. What are you going to spend your consumption expenditures on? What are you going to do with your savings? That which you choose not to spend. Why do you save? You save because you're going to move purchasing power from this period into the future. And you need some mechanism, you need some device to do that. Right? And I'll allude and come back to, the, to that choice in, in a moment. All right? First, I want to talk about the economy, the level of economic activity. When you're in the market economy, business goes in cycles. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not so good. Economic activity increases, we call that a recovery. If it's a strong recovery, we may even call it a boom. If it's a recession, economic activity is, is declining. A severe recession is called a depression. A long time ago when I was in graduate school, the National Bureau of Economic Research defined a depression, excuse me, defined a recession as three consecutive quarters of declining economic activity. A quarter being a fourth of a year. January, February, March, first quarter. Okay, etc. Okay. The current definition is two consecutive quarters of declining economic activity. Okay. So the rules of the game change. About the time you figure them out, they change them. <laughs> Second term, or third term I want to mention is GNP versus GDP. Now, these are macroeconomic terms about the entire economy. Gross national product, four parts. Market value of all final goods and services produced in an economy in a year. 
market value sends up flags. Because if you're measuring things at the market value, you're measuring things at their prices. Everything's staying the same. Prices go up by 6%. GNP goes where? Up by 6%. Okay. Market value. Market value of what? All final goods and services. Not all goods and services, but final goods and services. I buy a pickup truck, final good. I'm a consumer. Cox Cable buys a pickup truck. It's not a final good. It's an intermediate good because it's an input into the product that they sell, TV service. Okay, so we're measuring the market value of final goods and services produced, okay, produced using a nation's resources. That's why the N is there, national product. And in a year, and we usually use the calendar year, January 1, December 31, to crank out that statistic. Second term, GDP, is gross domestic product. Market value of all final goods and services produced within a nation's borders in a year. So that, go, that goes to measure what GDP did, but it only measures it for the production that's going on in a nation. There's a Ford plant south of here in Mexico. I know that because I see the trains coming through with cars. Okay. The output of that factory in Mexico, of final goods and services, is measured as U.S. gross national product. Ford is a national company in the United States. Our nation's resources, allegedly, produced that final product. That output also counts toward Mexico's GDP because that plant is in Mexico and those final goods and services are produced in Mexico. Now, these numbers are quite large. I know this is fact because I found it on the internet a couple days ago. <laughs> but the reported GDP for the United States for 1922. What? 2022. 2022, yeah. Getting get old. <laughs> is $20.89 trillion. $20.89 trillion. GDP? That is the GDP estimated for 2022 in the United States. Okay? What's a trillion? More than I can count. More than I can count. I have trouble with numbers over 100. Okay? <laughs> I can't imagine a thousand cans of Coke in this room. Okay? Here's a way. If you spend one dollar every second, and you do that 60 times a minute, 24 minutes, uh, 12 hours, 24 hours in a day, seven days a week, Spend money. If you want to spend a million dollars, it only takes you 11.6 days to do that. You want to spend a billion dollars? The senator from Illinois always used to say, we go to Congress and we spend a billion here and we spend a billion there. Before long, you're spending bad money. <laughs> you want to spend a billion dollars that way? It's going to take you 31.7 years. How about a trillion? Well, our GDP's got 20 of those puppies there. Trillion dollars to spend that in those procedures will take you 31,688 years. Think about it. <laughs> a long time. Okay the size of numbers, okay? I move on. The level of prices in the United States 
or any country, <coughs> are measured in dollars. But the value of dollars changes. I love when I was a science teacher, a meter is a meter, a yard is a yard, and we can talk about the differences. But then I became an economist, and now we measure things in dollars, but those damn dollars are expandable. Dollars measure different things in, in different ways. Inflation is a time period when prices go up. Now, I want to remind you, you talk about increased prices, those prices can go up either in a output market, which is what most of us will identify with, but they can also go up in an input market. I got no problem with inflation in my wage market. I'm happy to see my wages go up. Okay. And the name of the game may be to keep my wage increases in a percentage term higher than the price increases of the stuff that I want to buy. Okay. So that, that is inflation. Deflation is the reverse, and that is when prices, prices fall, declining, declining prices. All right. How does government... How does government deal with these things? Well, it deals with taxes. Taxes are a way that the government gets its income. Right? I always start this discussion with everyone agreeing with me. <laughs> About taxes, that is. Everybody wants taxes that are fair. I ask you that, I'm sure everybody, hey, I'm all for fair taxes. But if I go around and give each of you a sheet of paper and ask you to write down what your interpretation of a fair tax is, I suspect I'm going to get a different answer from each of you. Yes, we can agree on fair taxes, but on the other hand, when we specify what we mean by, spare ta by fair taxes, uh, the answer is different. Government collects money in order to expend it, to spend it. You want to be clear, there are two types of government spending. There's a government spending for goods and services. And then there's a second type of government spending called transfer payments. They're called transfer payments because there's no currently produced good or service exchanged for it. But you move, you transfer purchasing power, in this case from the government, to those people who are deemed needing of it, in order that they can go out and spend, <laughs> in order to get stuff, basic food, clothing, and, and, and shelter. The, dare, the word that comes up is deficit. A deficit is an income term. It is a flow term. But the deficit is a variable that is associated between a beginning time period and an ending time period. Usually January 1, December 31, if you're a corporation. If you're the government, their fiscal year begins on October 1st, and goes to September 30th. It used to be July 1st, for obvious reasons, 4th of July. So they started the accounting year then. So we had one accounting year that went for 15 months to push the accounting period start from July 1 to October 1. Right? The deficit is a flow concept Government expenditures exceed income. Some more numbers to bother you with. Expenditures, off the internet, were labeled this year at 6.27 trillion. Income was recorded at 4.9 trillion, giving us the small deficit of 1.37 trillion dollars, which is this year's spending this year's expenditures by the federal government in excess of its income. 
That's what a deficit is. Don't confuse the deficit with the debt. The debt's a different beast. The debt is the accumulation of past deficits. <laughs> so if you ran a deficit last year, that part of this year's debt. And if you ran a deficit two years ago, it's part of this year's debt. If you ran a deficit three years ago, it's part of this year's debt. Okay? All right. The debt in 1922, 19, she's getting old, come right. <laughs> the, the deficit, uh, the, the budget debt in 2022 is $31.46 trillion. So, not only does it take you 31 years to pay it off, if you spend it <laughs> once a second, there's 31 trillions of it. Budget. Budget is a plan. We plan what our expenditures should be. We plan what our income will be. This is what a budget is. All right? Unfortunately, planning on one hand may be different than the actuality on the other hand. If we ran a balanced budget this year, this year's expenditures equal to this year's income, what would happen to the debt? Nothing. Nothing. Very good. I'm happy you've come to that conclusion. Okay. So that when our friends in the legislature are questioned about the national debt, and they answer about the deficit, it's a conversation more about smoke than it is about light. Okay? So please be aware of that. If you want to reduce the debt in this nation, you have to run a, you have to run an expenditure that is smaller than your income. You have to have savings. You have to collect more in federal taxes than you dispense in federal taxes. In the old, in our, for a household, that would be your income, right? If you, if you're as a, if you as a householder have more income than expenditures, you have savings. You've got a surplus. If you're expending more than your income during this year, you're going in the hole financially. You're running the deficit. You're contributing toward the debt. So even if the government were to balance its budget between now and forever in the future, the debt is still there. So that's the nature on that. Now, a little sidebar just before questions. Maybe I'm going to get questions about this. We'll see. The maximum debt is reached when lenders refused to lend. There is some upper bound on your ability to incur debt and liability. And in the real world, the limitation is when you can't borrow anymore. <laughs> Somebody cuts you off. Okay. All right. The debt ceiling has got nothing to do with that. The debt ceiling is a reach by a group of legislators who pontificate about how evil these deficits and debts are, but at the same time keep amassing them. In reality, it becomes not, you, know, you default when people are unwilling to lend you money. Governmental, U.S. governmental debt is unique. All right. It's unique because the world uses U.S. dollars in their trade and exchange. Countries, foreign, co foreign companies keep their savings in dollars. Why? 
because relative to other dollar, other currencies, the dollar is stable. Okay. You want to put your savings in Turkish dollars? <laughs> Venezuelan dollars? <laughs> Cuban, uh, not dollars, but Cuban currency. Uh, pesos. Pesos or whatever. So the point is, if, if, if the U.S. government were to default on its bets, it isn't just an impact in the United States, it's an impact on world markets. Prior to World War II, the British pound sterling was the currency of the world. After World War II, the currency of the world shifted to the American dollar, the U.S. dollar. Okay. <coughs> I have to caution myself. I had a roommate from Paraguay one time, and we had this long, lengthy debate one afternoon over a few beers. He kept claiming that he was an American. Well, yeah, Paraguay's in America, South America. He insisted I was not an American. I was an American, just as he was an American. But I was a U.S. citizen, whereas he was a Paraguayan citizen. So I always think of Carlos when I come to this uh, point. So this is what it has happened. Right? In the United States, the money supply is backed up by the U.S. government, which tries to keep its value and its supply relatively stable. backed by U.S. government. James Bond movies, not true. Okay? When they steal the gold from Fort Knox, okay, it's really not happening. The density of gold being what it is, okay, right? what somebody figured out, you know, somebody told me that a ton of gold weighs, what was it? A cubic foot, a cubic foot, a cubic foot is 1,200 pounds. A cubic foot of gold is 1,200 pounds. Mm -hmm. So we call it a heavy metal. Yeah, <laughs> and it is. It is an extremely heavy metal, mm -hmm. and, and and that's part of the reason why it used to be used as 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 money because you could test its purity very easily by figuring its volume and its weight. You figure the density of it, and that was why why it was used. Okay, let's move to modern America, <laughs> modern United States. Okay. Monetary policy is the policy that influences the money supply. The money supply influences economic activity, changes prices, changes outputs, changes spending, changes saving. Okay. What is money in the United States? Okay. Money could be anything that is generally accepted. Anything that is generally accepted for money is money. I used to tell my students that I was trying to convince the woman that ran a college bookstore to accept orange pieces of paper with my picture on it. It seemed foolish to me that she would accept green pieces of paper with president's pictures on it. She ought to accept orange pieces of paper with my picture on it. She'd never do it. <laughs> but in reality, it really doesn't make any difference. If she did accept it, those orange pieces of paper in the college bookstore would be money. The fact that they're not accepted means they're not money. Okay. What's the money supply in the United States? Here's, this, this is the key here. The money supply in the United States is currency in circulation plus deposits at commercial banks. Commercial banks. Commercial banks. Those are the kind of banks you and I do business with. They're scattered all over your town. Banks where you hold your checking account. You may be fortunate enough to have a savings account. You may have a time deposit account. You may have a CD. Those deposits in that commercial bank are definitionally part of the money supply. Let me go back to the first term. C 
currency in circulation. That means those green pieces of paper that I alluded to before that are outside the banking system. In circulation means outside the banking system. Right. When those green pieces of paper go inside the banking system, currency in circulation goes down, the money supply goes down, but if you deposit that money into the bank, the bank deposits go up. The money supply hasn't changed in total, but the composition of the money supply has changed. Outside money has become inside money. Outside the banking system has become money inside the banking system. Right? It's the banks, it's the commercial banks versus the rest of us. Currency in the bank is not part of the money supply. But it's still currency. Question. Is Federal Reserve considered part of the banking system? The Federal Reserve is the regulatory agency of the government that regulates commercial banks. Okay? I'll be there in a second. <laughs> commercial banks are governmentally regulated private businesses which earn profits by producing money. Commercial banks are privately held, governmentally regulated business institutions that create money. Commercial banks make money and commercial banks make money. They make money in the sense that they're profit maximizing business firms like any other business firm. And the way they make money, the way they make a profit, is by creating money. That's the nature, that's the nature of the central bank, okay? The Federal Reserve is the central bank. The Federal Reserve is that governmental agency that regulates the ability of commercial banks to make loans and therefore create money. <coughs> Question, yes? Well, the feds are, because the feds are controlling interest rates and they're well, out. I, I'm, 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 I'm not going to accept the fact that the Fed controls interest rates. Okay. I'm, I'm defining the money supply as currency in circulation. By that I mean currency that is outside the banking system. Plus currency in circulation, plus checking account balances, deposits at commercial banks. That's, that's what the money supply is. Okay. Let me go on a little further. Yes, sir. Real, real quick question about the commercial. I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt. Let's hold our Q&A until Bill finishes, and well, we'll be glad to call it on you. You'll have to raise your hand, so please. Okay, well, they, they did raise right. their hand, and we'll so get, we'll get to you. Thanks. Okay. okay, so the commercial banks, then, uh, is, are regulated by the Federal Reserve, okay? The Federal Reserve has its headquarters in Washington, D.C. The Federal the monetary policy is carried out by 12 district banks that are located at various cities around the United States. All right. The banks in this area belong to the 12th Federal Reserve District, which is headquartered in San Francisco. The country is divided off into 12 zones, banks that are within the geography limit of, of a particular zone belong to that Federal Reserve Bank. Okay, when a commercial bank gets a deposit, its liabilities go up because the commercial bank owes that deposit to the depositor. You are lending money to your commercial bank. And for that activity, they pay you an interest rate. They pay you an interest rate on your time deposits, your certificates of deposit, your savings deposits, your demand deposits. That is the interest rate that is paid by, by commercial banks. Alrighty. When a bank gains deposits, it gains reserves. The name Federal Reserve comes from the fact that the reserve is the positive entry on the bank's books that counterbalances the liability that the bank incurs by borrowing money from you. Okay. And they pay you an interest rate for that. 
So, when you look at a bank's books, it has all of these deposits from all of its customers. It has some checking accounts, some time deposit accounts, some savings accounts, etc. The bank has what's called reserves that are equal in dollar value to those. The Federal Reserve Bank sets up a reserve requirement that says commercial banks have to hold a certain percentage of those deposits as required reserves. Those reserves that are in excess of those required reserves are termed excess reserves. And here's where the magic begins, because excess reserves are potentially loanable. You put money in a bank, you, put, you make a deposit in a bank. Banks, the bank deposit liabilities go up, the bank's reserves go up. The Federal Reserve, the regulator of these commercial banks, says a certain fraction of these reserves have to be kept by the bank. Any reserves over that amount are potentially loanable. All right? So a borrower comes into the bank and says, I want to borrow $10,000. The banker looks at excess reserves. He has excess reserves. The banker can make the loan, provided that the banker is convinced that the borrower is going to repay the loan. Banks only lend money to people who don't need it. <laughs> they only lend money to people who they're confident are going to repay it. Exactly. Okay? That's the way. If you want to make a profit, that's, what, that's who you got to deal with. You got to live with, you got to deal with people who live their work. On his books, he considers that to be an asset because the borrower owes money to the bank. What does the bank give to that borrower? A checking account. If you borrow $10,000, they put instincts, instincts on your account number <laughs> and you now have $10,000 worth of checking account balances. At that point, what's happened to the money supply? It's gone up because the bank has taken this IOU and converted it into a checking account balance. And the borrower writes a check for $100. The depositor writes a check for $100. Any difference? No. When's the last time you, you paid a bill with a check and the person who you paid says, is this borrowed money or is this deposited money? <laughs> There's no difference. But the money supply is currency in circulation plus demand deposits, checking account balances at commercial, at, at, at commercial, commercial banks. When is that money destroyed? The money was created when the loan was made. The money's destroyed when the loan's paid, paid back. So that's basically how commercial banks make money. They lend out. The reserves they can lend out, they lend out. The reserves they choose not to lend out, out of cushion, emergency money, they have to keep money for check clearing purposes. That's essentially the money. The joke used to be the banker's rule of three. We had to modify it, but back, back in the old days, they used to pay 3% on your savings account. Okay? Back in, back in the good old days. Okay. Second three in the scenario was the banker would raise that three, buy another three, and lend money to people at 3% more than they're paying to depositors. And if the banker did this properly, only lending money to people who repay it, mm -hmm. the bank would be very profitable. So profitable, in fact, that the banker 
can get to the can get to the country club and make his three o'clock tea time. <laughs> <laughs> you borrow, you buy, you buy low, you sell high. The bank buys money from depositors and does what with it? Pays them a low interest rate. Turns around, lends that to, sells it to people at a higher interest rate. And that spread, fancy name, the spread between the interest rate paid to depositors and the interest rate charged to borrowers is the stuff of which bank profits are made. So, the reserve ratio then is one of the mechanisms that the, that, that the Fed uses. The reserve ratio for time deposits used to be lower than the reserve ratio for savings deposit, which was lower than the reserve ratio for che checking accounts. Okay. Back in the old days, it was against the law to pay interest to checking account balances because of their connection with money. That's since been discarded. Went to the internet looking up what is the reserve ratio for all these various deposits. Currently, the reserve ratio is zero. Oh. Does the bank have to hold required reserves? Not any longer. Uh -oh. <laughs> Which then means that the bank's ability to make loans, ability to make loans, is determined by the risk that the banker is really getting able to, to take. Okay. So, therein, therein is, is, is the secret. The interest rates that I believe you are referring to earlier are called the federal funds rate. The federal funds rate is, federal refers to the Federal Reserve System. The federal funds rate is the interest rate set by the Federal Reserve System where commercial banks will lend money overnight to other commercial banks. Okay? So if a bank doesn't have reserves and it needs reserves, what does it do? It borrows it from some other commercial bank. Okay? And that's within the rules of the Federal Reserve because the Federal Reserve is regulating the money supply, only partially regulating any individual commercial bank. The second ratio uh, interest rate that you might hear is something called the discount rate. The Federal Reserve discount rate is the interest rate that is charged by the Federal Reserve Bank itself to lend money to commercial banks. And looking up on the internet, I discovered that the federal funds rate, banks lending overnight to other banks, is 4.58% currently. And the federal funds rate, if they can't find their money in the federal funds market, they may have to go borrow from the Federal Reserve. A little bit of a stigma associated with that. Because if you're borrowing from the Federal Reserve Bank, it's because you're pushing that expansion of the money supply to a much higher degree than it ought to be. That, in, that rate is 4.75%. So it's, it's a quarter of a percentage point, roughly, uh, higher. So, so basically, that's, that, that's how all of this is, is, is done. Mm -hmm. The magic, of course, is that commercial banks get money and then loan that money back out. And as long as they do it prudently, as long as people keep accepting those mm -hmm. checks, and as long as people keep accepting that currency, the money supply goes on. Question, Paul. Yes, I have a question for you. Can you talk about briefly about a run on the banks and how that works? Yeah, a, a run on the bank is, given what I've described mm -hmm. to you, some people's money that's in that bank really isn't there because the bank has lent it out to a borrower. A run on the bank happens when the depositors run to the bank when the light bulb goes on that the money may not be there. They run in the bank right, and try to withdraw their money out. It's a wonderful life. Exactly. <laughs> what I okay. was 
right? Where James Stewart is trying to describe to these customers of this bank that the money they got in the bank maybe isn't there because it's lent out to their neighbors. Okay. If there's a run on the bank, what does the Fed do? It hires a semi, goes to the Federal Reserve Bank in whichever the 12 districts this bank is in, puts a couple pallet loads of currency on the truck, <laughs> sends the truck down to the bank, and passes it out. And if the one truckload don't work, they'll send down another truckload. Eventually, people decide, well, the money's there. So, and of course, if people run on the bank and they take their money out of bank A, where did they go? Bank B. They go to bank B. Okay. So the run on the bank is just a temporary thing. I can't, I cannot tell you when the last time there was a run on a bank in the United States. Because you also have FDIC, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Any bank that belongs to the Fed has to carry FDIC, Federal Deposit Insurance. So your 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 your, your deposits are are insured. State of Illinois has bound from Illinois. State of Illinois has bank examiners. They go around unannounced, show up. Controller of the currency has bank examiners who show up and examine the bank's books. And if you don't have what you say you have, you tell them that you've got three, $300,000 in, in currency in your vault, and you don't, they're just gonna shut you down and neighborhood banks will take over the operation, depositors being protected with their FDIC insurance. Okay. Example of transfer, please. A transfer payment? Yeah, example please. Yeah, GNP would be aid to the families of dependent children. Uh, the one that really gets students hackles up, veterans benefits. Okay. Next, next, next question, commercial banks, you said uh, the money supply has to do with commercial banks. There are banks in South Dakota or North Dakota where you can hide money, right? But just like unaware of that. Well, just like Switzerland or Bank of Scotland, where 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 people can hide their, hide their assets, hide their money. When you hide money like that, if you're not aware, then I can't answer the question. If that hidden money is part of the money supply. Where are they hiding it from? Taxes. Oh, well, oh, tax dodge. That, that that that's separate than what is actually deposited into, into, into the well, bank. It's deposited. It's the bank's but but if it, but if the number is misstated to the IRS. Banks have no control over that. Okay, third question. Would it make sense to eliminate the, the statutory? The debt ceiling is, is a law, it's statutory. It was, it was done in 1917, for people that don't know, for, uh, for World War I to pay, to pay debt for, for what happened in World War I. Does it make sense for us to write our congressmen to eliminate the statutory limit? And do what with the debt? Who cares? <laughs> I can't. I can't accept that because the de the, the debt exists. The money the debt, is the owed. Debt exists, the debt exists, but how does that change your life? I'm going to argue that it doesn't. Okay. So why have the statute? To give them something to talk about. <laughs> and try about to them. All you're going to get into. All you're going to talk about. <laughs> good, good point. I, I agree with that. Can you comment briefly on the effectiveness of the, the Fed in using monetary policy to control inflation? Well, if, if, if they increase the money supply, I would expect prices to go where? Up. Oh. Oh. If they decrease the money supply, I would expect no. prices to go But how effective have they been? Oh. In your estimation. I, 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 effective enough. We have periods of recession and, 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 and depression when we ought not have. I argue those are timing mechanisms that are different. It takes time from when the Fed takes some activity for that impact of that. We talk about the Fed can decrease the money supply very easily by raising the reserve ratio, by raising the discount rate in, in the 
federal funds rate. Right? That clamps off spending. But if they lower the reserve ratio to zero, they lower the discount rate and, and the federal funds rate, excess reserves are available for loans. That doesn't say they will get loans because somebody has to come in and want to borrow the money. It's called pushing on a rope. I tie a rope around that chair and can pull it toward me. Pushing on the rope doesn't make the chair go in the other direction. Okay, but the Federal Reserve has all this, all these rules and regulations and they're keeping an eye on these banks. How did we get in the mess we got into a few years ago when these banks were giving out loans for, to people who could never pay them back? And they were buying houses all over the place like crazy. Second kind of bank. Commercial banks, the banks you and I deal with. There's something known as investment banks. Uh, investment banks are banks that are de get deposits from huge business corporations and the like. And the people from these investment banks are going to use that money that they borrow in the financial markets, the stock markets, and those sorts of things. I really have little or no knowledge about how investment banks work. Okay? But I think the problem was there because the, the wire loans, the no down payment loans, and, and those sorts of lending activity that went on. Okay? Those were decisions that were made by individual commercial bankers. And in my judgment, the federal government was incorrect by making all those taxpayers bail the blankety blanks out. The financial crisis of 2008 was initially caused by individual commercial banks making loans to uncreditworthy borrowers. These loans ought not have been made. The loans were made, were then packaged into tranches which were sold to financial institutions and other kinds of customers. The ratings companies claimed that these loans were the equivalent of U.S. government loans, which they clearly were not, and so the failure is the responsibility of the individual commercial bankers to make the loans. The Federal Reserve only controls the amount of money. It does not control the quality of the loans that are made by financial officers of commercial banks. Uh, yes, sir. I'm, I'm going to kind of throw you a curveball. Uh, you, you talked about the debt, federal debt, uh, earlier. Um, are you familiar with modern monetary theory that says the federal government can borrow as much as they want because they're borrowing from themselves? And, fear, and, and if all we need is the political will to define things differently, right, can you deal? Can you talk about that? Well, I don't know that we're buying that. If the federal government debt was held exclusively by U.S. citizens, I would acknowledge that we owe it to ourselves. But I know for a fact that citizens of China and the government of China and the government of a whole lot of other countries and a whole lot of large corporations own the U.S. federal debt. So you're not, you don't have the key modern, modern monetary theory is what you're I, telling I, That is correct. That comes out of the University of Chicago and I, I am I am suspicious of the Chicago boys who have such faith and confidence that the marketplace will always, always solve your problems. Okay, you got a question. That's yeah. why on one hand this and on the other hand that. But when you were talking about money supply in the U.S. and the two components of money supply, I'm going, well, where, where do you do stock market investments go? Because you're not depositing. That's a form of savings. Oh. Okay. You're not spending it for stuff. You're trying to move your purchasing power to the future. Uh -huh. And you can move your purchasing power to the future by buying stocks, mutual funds, etc., hoping that the value of those funds will carry out. So it counts as money supply? It's not, it's not part of the money supply. It's not? No. no. Stock, what's going on in the stock market has totally nothing to do, has totally nothing to do with the money supply. Right. 
and has really nothing to do with the corporation because the price in the stock market is determined by the buyers and sellers of stocks. Right. Those people who own stocks have to sell the stocks to people who don't own them. And if the price of Acme Widget goes up, that in no way is reflected on Acme Widget's T account. It, it doesn't get any of those proceeds. Anything that exchanges is between the former owners of the stock and the new owners of the stock. All right, let's give Bill a big round of applause. Thank, Thank you. you. Bernie Madoff totally fictionalized trades and sales. He would get the information and two or three days later he had a group of people which would create fictitious buy and sell orders which were then communicated to his clients as though he had invested the money with these companies which he did not do. Everything he did was fictitious. It was after the event had happened and the rewards that were paid to people who wanted their money were paid by people who contributed into the fund later. Right. It was t total, totally fictitious. So it's called. Uh, today there are four ways that societies can organize their economies. Socialism, capitalism, fascism. <laughs> you can start over. One of the basic rules of economics is what is known as the Tansafall Principle, which stands for the fact that there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. For every benefit, there is a cost that is borne by somebody along the line. 